as part of our ongoing role and support of our judicial network in Central and Eastern Europe, the Seeley Institute presents Judiciaries in Peril. This series shines a spotlight on pressing issues facing the judiciary in key countries of the region and explores the challenges faced that undermine and imperil that nation's judiciary and the rule of law. Thank you for joining us for this, our sixth Spotlight uh, webinar event where we focus on the judiciary in Hungary. I'm Frida Greeley. I'm a program manager at the Seeley Institute in Prague. And before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to hand you over to Chris Lehman, Executive Director of the Seeley Institute, for a brief welcome. Thank you, Frida, and good afternoon to our panelists and to our guests. Um, this is uh, one of our ongoing spotlights focusing on judicial challenges to some of the countries uh, in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, today, obviously, Hungary will be the focus of our attention. Um, these series have allowed us to really look uh, in depth at uh, some of the judiciaries that have been most challenged. Um, Hungary obviously is an interesting case because it's a European Union member, uh, and yet the judges have struggled uh, really for the last decade with a high degree of, of government interference. Um, this project is part of a much larger project that we have at the Seeley Institute, which is our network of judges from Central and Eastern Europe, um, almost 200 judges from 18 countries over the last 10 years participating in this network. We have used it to um, bring judges together to share experiences, discuss challenges, um, write and draft tools that will be of use to the judges in the region. And we continue to, uh, to look forward to continuing this effort and certainly um, extend a warm welcome to any Hungarian judges that would be interested in uh, participating more uh, more deeply in the network. So Frida, without more, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Chris. So as I said, uh, we have three speakers and I'm delighted to introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, each presenter has about 10, 15 minutes and then we will move on to questions and answers. So firstly, we will hear from Andras Kadar. He's an attorney at law and co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, which is one of Hungary's oldest and largest human rights watchdog NGOs. He provides legal representation before domestic and international forums, including the European Court of Human Rights, and is responsible for HHC's various research projects, trainings, and advocacy activities in the areas of criminal justice, law enforcement, and the rule of law. Between 2008 and 2014, he was a member of the Independent Police Complaints Board, and this is a civilian oversight body adjudicating complaints into fundamental rights violations by the police. He's one of the two Hungarian members of the European Network of Legal Experts in General Equality and Non-Discrimination Matters. Secondly, we'll hear from Judge Victor Vadash, and he is a penal judge at the Budapest Regional Court and a member and spokesperson of the National Judicial Council. He represents the council in the executive board of the European Network of the Councils for the Judiciary, and he's responsible for the international relations of the council too. He deals with high profile economic crime cases, frauds, tax evasions, money laundering and organized crimes. And he also adjudicates regularly as an investigative judge at the Buddha Central District Court. Between 2012 and 2015, he was the director of the Hungarian Academy of Justices, which is the training institution for judges and court staff. And then we have Professor Agnes Kovacs, and she's an assistant professor in the Department of Human Rights and Politics at ELTE University in Budapest. She's also a researcher at Jot Vos Karoli Policy Institute, which is an NGO dedicated to promoting the rule of law and constitutionalism in Hungary. Her primary research interests are in constitutional adjudication, the legitimacy of judicial review and theory of legal reasoning. Recently, she was involved in international research projects 
on judicial independence and the quality of justice in Europe. She's a member of the editorial board of Fundamentum, which is a Hungarian human rights quarterly. So, as I say, uh, each speaker has about 15 minutes now, and I am delighted uh, to invite Andras to take the virtual floor. Over to you, Andras. Thank you very much. So, thank you for the kind invitation and the possibility to talk about uh, this very, very important issue. Uh, my role in, uh, in in today's session will be just to outline the historical context or the context of the past decade uh, regarding judicial independence. Uh, after gaining a landslide constitutional majority in 2010, the incumbent uh, Fidesz government uh, started a very incremental but very uh, systematic and conscious process of of weakening uh, the system of checks and balances, eliminating or occupying all those institutions and actors which can uh, provide a certain control over what the executive is doing. And as we all know, the judiciary might be the most important of these institutions, might be the branch of power that uh, is the most capable of, of controlling uh, excessive uh, measures and violations by the government. So it's no surprise that very soon after this landslide victory, the systematic undermining of judicial independence started. Uh, it started through legislative and organizational steps, which were part of this larger process of, 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 of gaining control over all the institutions and actors. And it was also, uh, this, this process was uh, accompanied by an attempt to prevent judges from actually speaking out against uh, this kind of undermining. So just to create a chilling effect, to make sure that judges would not uh, exert uh, resistance or ex exert significant resistance against these processes done through undermining the credibility of the judiciary as a whole, attacking individual judges and putting administrative pressure on judges through vaguely formulated internal policies. Uh, I'm going to talk about some aspects of the systemic undermining of judicial independence, but my colleagues will uh, say more about these individual steps. The process started in 2011 when there was an overhaul, there was a uh, re, so to say, reform of the administration of courts, creating the National Office for the Judiciary, uh, the president of which was elected by uh, the parliament, uh, who, according to the law, must be a judge, but since he or she is elected by the parliament and without a very meaningful role of the judiciary itself, we can regard him or her as an external actor, not someone representing the judiciary. The president of the National Office for the Judiciary was given in 2011 very important roles regarding the budget of the judiciary, appointment of individual judges, appointment of judicial leaders. Um, so basically as the Venice Commission formulated in um, their opinion on, on the reforms. Uh, it, these powers were way too wide in the hands to be in the hands of one, sing, one single person. Now, uh, not so long after this happened, uh, there was a compulsory retirement uh, of judges by uh, very abruptly, basically overnight, abruptly reducing the compulsory retirement age of judges. Uh, from 70 to 62 years of age. As a result of, of uh, this measure, like 300 out of the 3,000 Hungarian judges uh, were sent into early retirement. Uh, this measure was found to be discriminatory by the Luxembourg Court of the European Union. And after this uh, judgment was handed down by the uh, CGAU, uh, judges were offered uh, the possibility to return to their judicial positions, but not to their judicial administrative leadership positions. So they could choose between a, a quite substantial compensation or going back to become judges again. But if they were court presidents or vice presidents or collegium presidents beforehand, they had no right to regain those positions only if those positions were not fulfilled or filled in the meantime, 
but in most cases, those positions were filled by the time they could have returned, which means that the system managed to get rid of very senior judges and uh, leadership positions, providing the opportunity for the president of the National Office for the Judiciary to appoint new judges. And this uh, created a conflict between the National Judicial Council, which is Hungary's top uh, judicial self-governing body, uh, the body that uh, Judge Vadas is a member of and he's going to talk more about the council. Uh, 2018, the uh, NJC started to look into the practice of how the president of the, uh, of the NOJ is uh, appointing judges and found that there were serious violations which was uh, an attempt to actually overhaul the top tiers of the judiciary. Uh, parallel with this, there was this kind of rhetoric attack on the judiciary. Incumbent politicians tried to exert undue influence on the judiciary by undermining their credibility of individual judicial decisions or judicial independence uh, as a whole. I don't want to, I mean, I would love to give you uh, individual examples because I think that they are very illustrative and scary. I'm just gonna give you one example which concerns judicial independence as a whole. Uh, the uh, Speaker of the House of the Hungarian Parliament, Laszlo Kovér, gave a presentation at one of the uh, universities uh, the Faculty of, of State Administration. And what he said is here uh, on the slide, the system of checks and balances, I don't know what you learned about it, but it is dumb, forget about it. It has nothing to do with either the rule of law or with democracy. So basically he said that the checking of, 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 of the executive power is something that the students of ad state administration and law should forget about. Uh, he also said that judges must decide whether they are standing on the side of those who want to build the country or on the side of those who want to destroy the country, referring here to uh, opposition and forces that are critical of the government. Uh, there were also uh, attacks on individual judges who spoke out uh, against these procedures, who criticized uh, the NOJ president, who criticized uh, the government measures to undermine the judiciary. Uh, in Hungary, uh, the media is is largely overhauled by uh, the by friends of the government, so to say, and there have been some very fierce and very unjust attacks on 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 uh, on those judges who spoke out against uh, these processes. Uh, some of them actually won defamation lawsuits for false or distorted information that was disseminated against them. Uh, there were also uh, administrative measures to kind of chill uh, the, the freedom of expression of judges in this situation. As I mentioned, the NOJ president has very wide ranging rights in, in choosing and appointing court presidents. And these court presidents then in return can actually put pressure on individual judges through a wide variety of administrative measures. Uh, court presidents decide on the bonuses, the annual bonuses of judges, so they can cut these bonuses because the legislation and the uh, legal framework around these very vague. So basically, it's very easy to make arbitrary decisions. You're going to get a bonus. You're not going to get a bonus. And if you look at who got the bonuses and who didn't get the bonuses, you could very easily see that the Renitan, the dissenting judges were the ones who suffered consequences financially. Some of these judges were excluded from judicial working groups or training opportunities, or were simply provided with harsher working conditions. For instance, they were not provided with clerks to help their work. So basically there were all these administrative measures, uh, a kind of, um, you know, trying to prevent the judges from speaking Finally, my last uh, um, slide, what my colleagues will talk about in more detail, uh, there was a shift in of strategy in 2019 because throughout the decade, the Hungarian judges and judiciary provided to be very resilient actually. Uh, 
uh, they just did not give in to this kind of governmental pressure and uh, judges kept, certain judges kept speaking out publicly. Uh, also, when you look at the politically sensitive cases, you can see that judges took judicial independence very seriously. And even in, in cases that were very painful for the government, they decided on the basis of the law and their conscience and not according to political expectations. Uh, and, and I think there came a realization in, uh, the, in, in, in the Hungarian policymakers and, and the government politicians that they need to shift the strategy. And what happened is that in late 2018, this shift came along. And instead of trying to domesticate the whole judiciary through the court president, through the appointment of the court president, they decided just to attack the top tier of the judiciary, uh, the, uh, uh, the Curia, which is Hungary's high court. And it started by parachuting uh, Mr. Andras Varga into the position through a number of legal amendments that made it possible for him to be elected. He used to be a prosecutor, then a judge of the Constitutional Court, which is not part of the ordinary court system in Hungary. He had no judicial experience, no courtroom experience, no uh, experience with judicial administration. And then the NJC, the National Judicial Council, has the right to, to, to form an opinion on, on the election of the nominee for the Curia president position. And there was an express and sweeping objection against Mr. Varga. 13 members of the NJC voted against him and only one voted in favor of him because they said that he is not sufficiently independent and he cannot be seen by outside observers as sufficiently independent uh, due to the way that uh, he arrived at this position. And if you look at the Chief Justice's views on judicial independence, we will understand why before he became the Chief Justice of Hungary, before he became an ordinary judge, so to say, he called judiciary the most dangerous branch of power. He said that the concept of judicial self-administration was a delusion, a misunderstanding, and something that brings more harm than benefits. And he also said that the concept of the rule of law is so arbitrary that it has in the hands of European institutions and judges themselves become a tyrannical, moreover totalitarian concept that is used to suppress dissent by countries, illiberal regimes such as Hungary or Poland. Uh, and with after parachuting him into this position, there were further steps to actually increase the weight of the Curia, the High Court of Hungary, regarding the jurisprudence, regarding how cases are decided in Hungary. This is something that uh, Agnes will talk about in more detail. So what you have to see is there has been a decade long uh, struggle between the government, which is backed by the legislature and the Hungarian judiciary. And for a long time, judges really stood their ground and, and eventually there came the realization that if you narrow your focus and you try to use a, a top-down approach to somehow domesticate the judiciary, uh, it's easier than to deal with a body of 3,000 judges uh, raised and educated in the ethos of judicial independence. So uh, this is the historical context and I will be happy to hand over to my colleagues who will give you more of the details. That's great. Andras, thank you so much for that very useful overview. I'm now going to hand over to uh, okay. Judge Vadas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just very briefly, the National Office for the Judiciary uh, is, is, uh, was developed in 2012. And in Hungary, instead of a National Judicial Council, which is uh, uh, where the members are elected, or at least the majority of the members are elected by the peer judges, uh, there is this position, the president of this National Office, uh, Office for the Judiciary, who is elected by the parliament for nine years with two-third majority, which means that uh, uh, the judicial self-governing bodies has 
uh, they have no effect uh, on on who will be the, the chief justice in, in Hungary, I mean, who will be the chief of the judicial administration. This person, the president, is appointing all the court presidents, uh, but also uh, appointing the, the, pres the, the judges and deciding on the promotion of judges, training of judges, budgetary issues. Uh, but the most important thing that the Court presidents, they have enormous powers over the judges in Hungary because the court presidents, uh, they can decide in the evaluation of judges, the they can initiate a disciplinary procedure against the judge, they are deciding in the case allocation. Uh, also, they have uh, a direct effect on the working conditions of the judges and they decide on the bonus also. So uh, this made, uh, this system made a very, very strong Court management and central administration with this National Office for the Judiciary and a very, very weak National Judicial Council. But the remaining uh, body or elected by the judges, by the peers, is, 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 it doesn't even have a legal entity. Uh, we should supervise the presence of the, the office, but uh, the National Judicial Council, which uh, where I'm also a member, we don't have any tools. We don't have a separate budget which, that we can use and we don't have staff members. So there are only 14 judges who are keep dealing with their cases and beside that they need to uh, do some work in the judicial administration by trying to supervise anyhow the um, president of the National Office for the Judiciary. The only, only tool we have is to signal problems somehow. And if you're signaling these problems, uh, but, uh, then if there is nothing happening, the only thing that we can do, we can propose the dismissal of the president of the office, uh, but the decision uh, whether she or he will be dismissed is decided by the parliament, the parliamentary majority. So this is a very, it's not, not a very complex tool and not an effective tool in our hands to, to somehow uh, try to, to oversee and supervise the, uh, uh, the president of the National Office of the Judiciary. The third participant is the Supreme Court, which is uh, in the uh, past uh, 10 years was like an, like an island in the middle of the sea because the president of the National Judicial Office has no effect uh, on the, the Supreme Court and uh, the council was not the member of the, the president of the Supreme Court was a member of the, the National Judicial Council also, but was quite passive in the role uh, as member of the National Judicial Office. So the previous president of, the, of our Supreme Court of the Curia was not really uh, um, going into these, these debate between the National Office uh, for the Judiciary and the National Judicial Council. So what's the base of the conflict? Because Andras already mentioned this, but maybe I should give you a, a brief description, uh, description how the judges are appointed and promoted in Hungary. There's always an open application for each of the positions, which is launched by the president of the office. And all the candidates will be interviewed uh, by the local judicial council. So if there is an open position in a certain court, uh, in a regional court, then in this regional court, the uh, judicial council where the members are elected from the judges from that uh, court are interviewing the candidates and according to a ministerial decree and according to the uh, interview, they can uh, give certain points. They decide on cert to give some credit points to the candidates and each of the candidates are receiving these credit points and this will set a rank of the candidates. If the president of the National uh, Office for the Judiciary would like to appoint the first ranked candidate, then he or she can do it uh, without any further uh, uh, approval, but if he or she wants to appoint the second or the third ranked candidate needs the approval of the National Judicial Council uh, and without this uh, approval only the first ranked candidate so the winner can be uh, appointed uh, in this uh, competition. If someone has last points and uh, will be ranked fourth or fifth or, or even uh, uh, lower then uh, cannot be appointed for the, for the position. Uh, the appointment of court president is a little bit different because there is an open application and judges with uh, at least five years of experience can uh, uh, apply for this and the candidates need to show their uh, plans and intentions in a detailed program in line with the strategy and the aims of the president of the National Judicial Office and the conference of judges, I mean the, all the judges of that regional court 
will uh, form, formulate an opinion. Uh, this opinion is formulated by an election uh, where the uh, where all the candidates can receive a supportive or a not supportive uh, vote from each of the uh, members of that court, each of the uh, judges. And this is a secret ballot, of course. And uh, the president of the National Judicial Office can op uh, appoint only someone who received at least 50% support of the judges. So 50% plus one vote um, needs to have by the candidate to be appointed. Without this, only the uh, approval of the National Judicial Council can make it possible to uh, appoint some, to be appointed to a uh, court president or vice president. Of course, this system seems to be very uh, correct and in line with the international regulations, but we all know that the devil always uh, is uh, in the details. So I can give you two stories where uh, both of the stories are uh, unsuccessful applications. The first one in 2017, a Hungarian judge from the Perth Central District Court uh, was applying for, uh, be, for a position at the, the court of, regional court of appeal. And uh, after this interview, he was ranked first among several candidates, but the president of the National Judicial Office doesn't want it to uh, appoint him. Uh, because uh, uh, he was not in favor of this candidate. So the only thing she could do is to ask for the, pro to the approval of the National Judicial Council, but it was sure in 2017, the National Judicial Council would not approve for such a, uh, a uh, de de deterioration from the, from the rank. And uh, for this reason, she decided to call this, to declare this whole procedure unsuccessful. Um, she decided that we don't need that position anymore at that, that uh, certain court, at the Regional Court of Appeal. But uh, uh, despite this decision, on the next day, she restarted this procedure, the application. And this judge was applying once again, was ranked first once again. And the president of the National Judicial Office decided once again that this is an unsuccessful procedure because she may changed her mind. Uh, she doesn't want to uh, fulfill this position anymore. Uh, the second uh, opinion, second example is the president of the Metropolitan Court, the Budapest Regional Court, the largest court, where the uh, former president of the court was reapplying for his position. He, he is, uh, wanted to be elected for the next uh, six years. And uh, as the only candidate, candidate he was uh, supported by 75% of the judges. Uh, after the, 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 this, the president of the office, uh, the judicial office decided to, that this is also an unsuccessful uh, application because uh, she doesn't want to uh, uh, appoint him to become the Metropolitan Court. And after this, the procedure was restarted and uh, uh, when the candidate was applying once more with a uh, large support of, of, of the judges, but we was refused once again by the, the president of the judicial office. And this whole thing uh, escalated uh, as a new council was elected in 2018. And after these, uh, these happening, uh, before the, the, the judges were uh, electing very critical members, they were sure that they would be very, very critical uh, with the presidents of the National Judicial Office. And the new members immediately started an inquiry. And based on this uh, inquiry, they, uh, we declared that this practice of the national uh, president of the National Judicial Office by calling, declaring unsuccessful these applications is totally against the law. Of course, formally, it seems OK. But if we look behind the intentions and the way she exercises this and uh, the, the, the practice and the pattern shows that this is the misuse of her, her powers. And uh, we, we warned her that she shouldn't uh, continue this, this procedure. Of course, it was not really successful because as an answer to this, the presidents of the National Judicial Office started to pressure some of the members and members of the National Judicial Council and some members and uh, uh, pro uh, substitute members resigned. And then the president of the National Judicial Office declared the, the National Judicial Council an illegitimate party. And also there were other, other uh, reactions. One of the reactions was the, uh, against not only the, the uh, uh, members of the National Judicial Council, 
with uh, some articles in the government media, uh, slander campaign against the judges, against the OBT members, but also against the Hungarian Association of Judges. So members of the Judicial Association were listed by court presidents and uh, they were called that uh, maybe they should resign from the association and other uh, retaliative measures were taken against the association. Uh, so it was like an open war between the judicial administration, between the president of the judicial office appointed by the parliament and uh, court presidents appointed by the by this uh, president of the uh, national judicial office against all the judges, or the, against the association of judges, against the national judicial council. Some examples about this uh, defamatory articles in one of the in, in the Hungarian radio broadcast, the president of the uh, National Judicial Office uh, after the National Judicial Council was uh, uh, inviting the newly elected president of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary for a visit to Hungary. Uh, the, uh, the, the, she gave an interview and uh, she, she said that I find it regrettable that some of our judges forgetting themselves and their duties and responsibility for the community go abroad and betray our country. So these were uh, quite uh, very uh, strong, quite strong words against uh, uh, members of the National Judicial Council. Also in the favorite newspaper of the Hungarian Prime Minister there's an article that the mine working of some judges together with Soros Network another newspaper named five members of the council in a long article and stated that uh, council is politically biased against the government in various ways which can be deducted by court cool decisions where members were involved as acting judges in the past uh, andras uh, already mentioned that that uh, we needed to sue uh, these uh, government papers and we won the case uh, against them because of these defamatory, defamatory articles. So the question is that what, 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 what was the, what was the council, how the council was reacting after uh, eight times we gave, uh, uh, we, we gave a, a signaling, we were signaling problems and after this uh, we turned to the parliament in 2019 May and we asked the parliament to dismiss the president of the National Judicial Office. However, the parliament refused to investigate this and refused and in a very rapid procedure without the debate, they rejected our proposal. The question, how could this happen? Of course, I need to add some things to this. The president of the National Judicial Office was a close friend of the prime minister at that, and the family of the prime minister. Uh, the, and the, uh, she was the wife of a leader of the EP delegation, founding member of the governing party. Uh, uh, so this, Despite she was a judge and uh, the institution uh, in, uh, in the name of the institution, it's a judicial office, but it was obvious that all the appointment of, of the president of the judicial office was a political decision. And that's why the dismissal, not dismissing her, was also a political decision. But afterwards, in November 2019, finally, the government decided that she, they need to solve the problem. And the, pro the solution was, uh, their solution was to promote the president of the uh, National Judicial Office to the Constitutional Court and that new president was elected uh, by the parliament. This new uh, candidate was, was supported anonymously uh, by the National Judicial Council also. And we, we, we see right now after one and a half years that uh, the problem is that of course, it's, it's important that uh, there is a, that they tried to solve the problem by dismissing the previous president of the office. But this problem is a systematic problem. And systematic problem can only be solved uh, with a systematic answer. And this is not a systematic answer. This is an answer just changing the person. And uh, this new president seems to be very cooperative on the first is, but there are no real changes. And uh, despite the fact that the Venice Commission, the European Commission, the Greco, ENCJ, the International Association of Judges, so various international organizations were urging uh, for legal changes to strengthening the Judicial Council and not giving so much powers to a person who is appointed by the Parliament, it was not successful. And, and then the Council was, uh, there was no changes, no amendments. And then the Council was uh, proposing altogether 50 
uh, detailed amendments. The Minister of Justice refused all of it, and uh, she, the Minister of Justice said that uh, uh, they only find, uh, no, they don't find any of it, so zero uh, proposals uh, as acceptables, so there were no changes. Of course, the judges want finally peace and quiet, and it was very important that they received a salary raise in the past three years, but I think this salary raise was just uh, something that makes most most of the judges it makes makes them they silence them. So it's it's also it's a leash. It's a, it's it has a chilling effect because it, this salary raise is in three steps, and we are looking for the last uh, part of this salary raise. If we won't get this, then uh, of course, uh, if if the judges are too loud, they might not get this. So finally, uh, the new target, as Andras mentioned, will be the president of the Kuria, will be the Kuria, uh, because the government realized that the, the the national judicial office, they are not able to control through the national judicial office the whole judiciary, uh, because the the national judicial council is still fighting against the the uh, the president of the judicial office, but uh, they. Uh, we're choosing someone for the for this position uh, who is very loyal to the government, and uh, not because of his loyalty, but because of the, the ad hominem legislation, but which made possible his uh, uh, election, and also because he has absolutely no judicial practice. Uh, the National Judicial Council was not supporting, with a huge majority, was not supporting the election of the president of the Supreme Court, the Kuria. I think uh, Agnes will speak about that uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge uh, Vadash. That was uh, very informative. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, and now I will hand the floor over to Agnes. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. So in the remaining time, uh, I, I will speak about the Supreme Court specifically and tell the story of the top court of, of Hungary. Uh, and my aim is, first of all, to, to illuminate how the government has changed course in dealing with the Korea in order to contain and take control over the whole judiciary. And second, I hope that the story of the, of the Korea can uh, provide us a better understanding about the dynamics of judicial politics in authoritarian regimes, because what I claim is that Hungary uh, has turned into an authoritarian regime. So the story of the, the Supreme Court must be told, uh, told from uh, 2010, when the Fidesz took power, of course. And this story shows us a, a kind of dialectic between uh, disempowering the, the Korea as a first stage and then uh, empowering the Korea in the second, second stage. And uh, if, we, if we pose the question of what happened with the Korea in the last decade, we can see that after a fair attempt to curb the jurisdiction of the, the Supreme Court, the top court of Hungary, the, the government realized that in order to uh, control the whole judiciary, it is sufficient to control the top court, the most important weighted player in the judiciary, the, the, the Supreme Court, and therefore it uh, implemented another tool and, and started to empower rather than disempower what happened uh, previously. So it started to empower the Korea, transferring significant powers to the Supreme Court. And uh, parallelly, it packed or started to pack the court with politically reliable judges and started to capture the, the Korea with the tool of court packing. And it, uh, of course, we have to emphasize that the Supreme Court can be considered as the most important veto player within the judiciary as it is the, the the court of the last instance in, in civil cases and criminal cases and administrative cases as well. So the first stage after Fidesz took power in 2010 was about disempowering the Supreme Court and uh, the legislative steps that uh, have been made uh, at the beginning uh, 
was uh, targeting the independence of the Supreme Court and the government sought to curb the jurisdiction and formally limit the jurisdiction of the court. And some of the steps have already been discussed and addressed by Andras as well. So I will not go into the details of what happened, but of course we have to mention the very famous case of the former president, chief justice of the, of the Supreme Court, Bakka Andras, his case is very famous as it was brought before the Strasbourg court. So the, I, I, will, I will not uh, elaborate on more uh, what happened, but his mandate was terminated prematurely more than three years before the expiry of his mandate. This was the first step in 2011. And then of course, a large number of judges was forced to retire. It was also mentioned by Andras. And what we have to emphasize here is that these measures uh, affected seriously the top court, the Supreme Court as well, because experienced judges and judges in senior uh, court uh, positions were uh, forced to retire suddenly. And the very important element of this uh, story of how to disempower the, the, the Supreme Court, the Curia, is when the Constitutional Court was entrusted with a new competence to review the decisions of the ordinary judiciary and specifically the, the decisions of the Supreme Court. So a new competence was given to the Constitutional Court in 2012. Uh, which is called for constitutional complaint, and the, and the constitutional court was captured by the government. And today there is a politically captured constitutional court which can supervise the jurisprudence, the decisions of the Supreme Court, which of course affect the independence of the ordinary judiciary. So it was a, um, a measure that was introduced in 2012, and. A uh, last uh, step that I would like to mention is that there was a plan uh, to establish a separate system of administrative justice. It was on the government agenda in 2016, and the, the plan was made into a law in 2018. Uh, and this whole idea of channeling the the politically sensitive cases into a special court system, separate court system, which has a separate high court, top court as well, which is called the Supreme Administrative Court. So it was made into a law, but finally in, in 2019, the government retreated and announced that, that it withdrew the, the plan to organize and set up a separate system for administrative cases. So this is the the short story of, about those measures that, that uh, sought to uh, curb the competencies and the independence of the, of the Supreme Court. And afterwards, the, the, the government realized that, that, okay, we don't need a separate system for administrative justice, but we need to uh, change course and, and transfer more powers and competencies to the Supreme Court and at the same time capture the top tier of the judiciary. And uh, an omnibus bill, it was a very long bill containing very different various uh, regulations was adopted in late 2019. And this uh, bill and act uh, increased the power of, of the Korea. So it is a, a totally different uh, idea compared to what happened before. And just to name a few examples, what it means and how the role of the Supreme Court has been strengthened by this act is that a new form of an extraordinary appeal was introduced, for instance, which is uh, called uniformity complaint. Uh, and, um, under this, this new instrument, the, the judgment of the Curia can be appealed to the Curia. So even the Curia can monitor and control how the, the various panels of the Supreme Court decides on different cases. 
and uh, it can, I mean, uh, as a result of the uniformity complaint procedure, it can determine the mandatory interpretation of law, and it can even repeal uh, judgments of other panels of the Curia. So this is a very new instrument that was given uh, as a kind of power to the Supreme Court. The second one is that this omnibus act introduced so-called limited precedent system. It is called by the, by the government as a limited precedent system, which means that all the published decisions of the Supreme Court is binding on the Supreme Court itself and on the lower courts as well. And uh, in case a judge seeks to deviate from the interpretation that, that is contained in the published decision of the Supreme Court, she must provide reason for it. She must provide a justification for it. So this limited precedent system, again, strengthened the role of the Korean and how to interpret uh, the law, how to decide question, questions of law. And all these two instruments, they are very new ones, but it is clear that they uh, aim to limit judicial discretion, aim to limit the autonomy of individual judges in deciding cases. And the, and the third example can be that as part of the, the reform of the administrative court system, new competencies, further new competencies were provided for the Supreme Court. So currently from 2020, freedom of assembly cases are dealt by the Supreme Court. It is the first and final instance of dealing with most of the freedom of, of assembly cases. So all these measures, uh, can result in the empowering of the Supreme Court. And the parallel uh, measure was that the government started to fill the Supreme Court with loyal judges who are loyal to the government. So we can see uh, some examples of, of political appointments from recent time. One has already been mentioned by, by also by Andras and by uh, uh, Victor as well. So a new president of the Supreme Court was elected in, in 2020 and he uh, took office this year, Mr. Varga. And the new vice president of the Supreme Court was also appointed. And the very, very recent news is that a new administrative judge was appointed to the courier. And although his appointments or elections can be seen as political appointment, and if, if we want to figure out what, what are the common features of these appointment procedures and what are the common features uh, of the careers of these uh, judges, we can see that all of them, so, so the three uh, uh, has have a right from outside of the judiciary. One of the, the, the judges who, who is now the chief justice, the president of the Supreme Court arrived. So Mr. Varga arrived directly from the, the politically captured constitutional court. Uh, the vice president uh, can be seen also as a political appointee as he had very important functions that that can be seen as, as, as government-friendly functions. He served as the rector of a university that was established by the government and generously funded by the government. It is the National University of Pub Public Service. So he was the former uh, rector of this government-friendly university, and he was also the head of the National Election Commission. And the third uh, figure who was appointed just a few weeks ago uh, uh, to an administrative judge position arrived directly from the minister, Ministry of Justice, and he had very important positions. He was, for instance, the chief of staff of one of the former justice ministers and uh, served as, as, as someone who is in charge of setting up this administrative court system that was finally dropped by the government. And so this is a common feature in, in, in all of these appointments that 
these judges arrived from outside of the judiciary. It has also been mentioned that most of them had no judicial experience at all. Only one of the judges who was appointed as vice president had a short period of, of experience as a judge, but all the others uh, did not serve as judges of ordinary courts before. And uh, the, the third uh, common element in their career is that they were involved, or at least most of them were involved in some kind of scandals, which really makes their professional integrity as lawyers questionable. I will not go into the details what happened with them, but, but it is also, I guess, uh, elaborated and, and accessible in English as well. And, and the fourth kind of feature is that, that if we look at their previous positions, if we look at their statements, if, if we look at their academic career, it can be seen that they are close allies of the current regime. So, why the, so what we can see is that why the, the government entrusted with very significant and strong powers the Supreme Court at the same time it, it, it captured or at least started the process of capturing it by court packing, by filling the, the top court with uh, political uh, uh, appointments with judges who are uh, loyal uh, to the government and, and politically reliable. And I don't know whether I have time to conclude. What I would like to, okay, just a very short conclusion. So if we pose the question, it is an interesting question. Okay, what we can say about the state of judicial independence in Hungary today, of course we can see, or we can say that independence is a matter of degree. And of course, judicial independence cannot be fully eliminated. It cannot be fully destroyed. But the question is, that, that is it possible to win a case, a politically sensitive case against the government? Can we imagine that courts decide uh, which not uh, promote the interest of the government? Can we imagine that courts confront with the government? And it's a question that we can raise in the context of the jurisprudence of the, of the Supreme Court. And and what we can see in the most recent jurisprudence, and these are very recent trends and, and experience concerning the jurisprudence, the case law of the Supreme Court, we have to provide um, a fairly pessimistic reading because recently there were interesting cases handled by the Supreme Court on freedom of expression or media freedom or freedom of assembly cases. And uh, what we can see is that the Supreme Court uh, does not want to confront the government and does not want to make a decision that is unfavorable for the government. It's, these are very recent examples, instances of, of, of uh, decisions, but we have to be very, uh, worried about these trends, what's going on in terms of the jurisprudence and in terms of the development of the case law in the Hungarian Supreme Court. Thank you so much, Agnes. Some uh, very complex issues there, but that was extremely useful. You explained uh, those very well. So thank you so much for that. And I see in the chat, we do have, uh, there are three questions there. So maybe we will um, take them one by one. Firstly, there is a question about the public perception of, of the judiciary. And I wonder, firstly, I suppose, what is that public perception of the judiciary? And then also, have judges been able to use any other, or do they use any other media or methods to try and counter these attacks? So Judge Vadash, I might put that one to you first, if you would. Yes, thank you. It's, I think it's a very good question. And it's, it's the most important thing. If, if the people, the citizens, because judicial independence is not a privilege, it's, it's, it's a fundamental right of the people. And, but if the people are not protecting their judges, how do they expect the judges to protect them from the, from the government? 
in, in cases. So that, that's why it's a very, very uh, important issue. And uh, what, what I think is, is, is what, I, what I see in, in Poland, for example, where the judicial associations are very, very active and judges are very active and involved in, in these volunteer uh, campaigns to raise awareness among the people, among the society. So it's, it's very, very uh, important. Actually, I myself have a, an idea because um, I was thinking, because I, I feel myself a bit old for that, but I think I will open a TikTok account and start to, to give, make videos, share videos um, about what, what the judges are doing and why, why is it important so then they can ask questions. It's because it's, it's crucial that uh, the people who are now just maybe 15, 16, 18 years old, they will be the future uh, politicians one day and the future decision makers. Uh, I don't think that we can convince uh, our present decision makers uh, it, no matter what political opinions they have or what, which party they are standing, but they are not socialized in a way they would uh, truly respect rule of law and judicial independence, at least in Eastern Europe. It's, it, this is the sad uh, uh, truth. Uh, but I think we can change this from, from, from starting down from the bottom. bottom. Thank you. Um, Andras or Agnes, would you like to add anything there in relation to the public perception of the judiciary? Or I mean, What I can say is, is uh, part of the problem is that there are very strict rules uh, for judges and how they can address the public. So uh, actually, and, and when you have this kind of chilling environment and when you have court leaders who have been put into their places by, you know, those actors who are loyal to the government. That's no easy job for any uh, any judge to to speak out because actually, based on the regulation, on how they can talk to the public and about what they can talk to the public, it's going to be very easy to like launch disciplinary proceedings, them and so on and so forth. The one thing that I would try to attack is actually this kind of, uh, I think, uh, kind of misinterpretation, because actually in the Baca case that Agnes mentioned, uh, the, the Strasbourg court emphasized that when it comes to judicial independence, judges should be free to discuss publicly those issues that they think are threatening their independence. So while the freedom of expression of judges might be limited uh, in certain ways due to you know, the you know, separation of powers and so on and so forth, when it comes to judicial independence, they should have every right to speak out and that should not be sanctioned. So I think one one way, but you know, when you, I'm a lawyer, and you know, when you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail to you. But I still think that that one first step could be to kind of challenge uh, the regulation that makes it very difficult for a judge to decide whether this is something that he or she can you know speak up uh, about in public. And the question also regards the uses of media by the judges. This is, this is one of the core issues that prevents judges from being able to use uh, other channels than their own judgments to communicate with the public. Uh, and and, and uh, as I mentioned, government officials and high-ranking party politi politicians have no problem whatsoever you know, giving their very harsh opinions about judges and individual cases, and then judges have, you know, have difficulties responding to those because they could be accused of, you know, going politic, political as as it happens many times. It's not an, an even playing field by any means. Then, and Agnes, is there anything you'd like to add? What what I would like to add is that this is not just uh, an issue of of how judicial freedom of speech is regulated in Hungary, but it's a much broader question about the legal culture of Hungary and how judges are socialized within the judiciary. So it is a, it is a very deep politicized judiciary in Hungary, historically, and, and this attitude should be changed in order to make the judiciary apt for speaking up for itself, for its own interests. Sure. I mean, there is, I'm jumping over the questions, but there actually is a related question here. And uh, it says that uh, 
It notes the Polish government follows the Hungarian agenda. However, it faces strong resistance from judges associations. So the question relates to the situation of judges associations in Hungary. I mean, you have touched upon that a little bit, but maybe, you know, is there momentum there for judges associations or what what, uh, what motivates the judges associations? How, how are they uh, structured and what's their involvement? And maybe yeah. Judge Vadash, yeah, I can ask in, you. In Hungary, there's one large judicial association, very similar to Austria, where they have one single association. Uh, half of the judges are members of this association in, in Hungary. It should be quite strong, but it's not. Uh, and why is it why is so? It's I think it's a so. Um, yeah, this is how judges are socialized. So they, they don't really got, are used to uh, protesting uh, for their own rights. Uh, they actually the Hungarian Judicial Association has a cooperative agreement with the Minister of Justice, and they are really happy about it. Not, it they don't care about that uh, that the Minister of Justice is not uh, fulfilling this agreement. Uh, only the, only they, they they have this on paper, and uh, but so this is how they work. It's not that strong as in Poland, but I see that in the past two years there was a positive change because when the council was attacked, when the uh, judicial association was attacked, they started to show to give platform at least to to critical voices, and they do give uh, criti- uh, platform to critical voices. I think um, the in the future, if they're going to have a stronger leadership, they might uh, achieve something. And also there are new associations. One of the associations is Res Judicata, which, is, which seems to be quite strong on the rule of law issue uh, and also the international, uh, on the international level. And this, this gives and shows some hope. Uh, what, why, why the uh, Polish judges are more resilient than Hungarian judges? I think why the Polish people are more res- resilient than the Hungarian people? That's the other question. Sure. It was always historically this way. And if I could just ask you a, a follow-up question on that, because I know um, in the past you were involved with the Training Academy for Judges. And, you know, if we're talking about the future of the legal profession, the future of the judiciary, you know, is there, do you have a sense that there is maybe a new generation that may be more ethically minded or, or uh, socially conscious. Uh, do you have any sense that things may change? Absolutely, absolutely. I do have this, but I think Agnes is is more involved in the, in the, to the uh, this type of legal education. But uh, when I give lectures, uh, the the uh, law students are very open and very very critical thinking, which is also very important. We'll see what will happen with the universities in Hungary. That's also another question, but that's a political question, so I don't want to go get into that. Sure. So, Agnes, can I ask you then, um, how about your, your law students? What do you think the future may hold? Okay, so I'm a little bit pessimistic, but currently I'm not teaching at a, at a law faculty, but I'm, I'm, I'm teaching at a faculty of social sciences. And sometimes I make comparison between the students and how open they are in, in expressing their views, how critical they can be. And we can see differences clearly. And the, the, the legal education is, is very, I mean, uh, centered on the text and the doctrines and legal argumentation. And I saw, and I taught uh, a legal theory to the students and we always addressed very serious questions about what to do in a state of authoritarianism and, and what, what would be the obligation of a judge who must adjudicate in a system that is, that is not democratic anymore, what should have judges done uh, in the Hitler era. And, and, and these are very serious questions, but the law students are, are not really open to express their views concerning what to do. And they are more stri- stick to the idea that, okay, we are, we are judges, we, we have to uh, apply the law, this is our rules. And of course, it's a question for today, whether we can say that the current system of, of, of the Hungarian government uh, would encourage judges to rely more on principles and and more on international norms rather than to the text of the law. So it's a question that we should, I mean, 
opposed to current judges in the Hungarian system as well. Okay, very good. Uh, and I'll move on to another question here. And this is in relation to uh, support from those abroad or international support, perhaps judicial bodies in other countries, organizations active in rule of law. What type of support uh, would the Hungarian judiciary uh, find most useful, I suppose, at the moment? Um, maybe again, Judge Fadash, I'll, I'll start off with you. Yeah, it's it's very hard to answer this question. I think this is the the most difficult issue because uh, that's what we see that everyone knows about the problem. They real they they exact they have uh, very good information on what the real problem is and how it should be solved, but they are not able to enforce it. They're not able to put enough pressure on the government, not even the European Commission and and also the other organizations are way weaker. They have a weaker power than the European Commission. It's not able to solve it, but we need to keep push this. It means that what the National Judicial Council does is we are informing our uh, international allies through the European uh, uh, network partner organizations in the European network of councils for the judiciary. Also, there is the International Association of Judges and several other institutions. But I, what what I think is is the training would be even more important. There is an EJTN, the European Judicial Training Network, which seems to be very, uh, they, they're dealing with technical issues. The real problem is in Hungary, I think, that the judges who are chosen for an international study visit or an international uh, uh, training or, or any event, they're chosen by the president of the National Judicial Office which means they can be filtered. I think in Poland, it might be the same problem, that the training is, national training institution is, is captured. And if the training institution is captured, then the network is not uh, able to work. What the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary did, we needed to suspend the Polish KRS, and they might be expelled very soon from the, the network which is, of course, a very strong but very important uh, message to all the members and to all the stakeholders. So we are doing our best, but I know that this is, it seems sometimes a very hopeless fight and a hopeless battle with, with all the, the populist governments in, in Hungary and in Poland and in all over in Europe. Thanks for that. Andras, um, maybe I'll come to you and see, do you have any suggestions on... Obviously, when you have a type of government that has so systematically and consciously built up the system. Um, there's only so much you can hope, but I mean, I think uh, judicial associations, national or international, could actually participate in those processes that put a limelight on, 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 these, on these developments, like the rule of law report of the commission. Now, you know, that deadline has passed, but that there's gonna be another one next year. Also raising these issues in, in bilateral, talks asking asking you know people all the inconvenient questions like you know you have you know like the the relationship between the noj and the njc i mean the greco has criticized it the european commission has criticized it the venice commission has criticized it the the hungarian laws regarding the judiciary have been amended like a hundred times in the past two years now, anytime someone has the chance to ask someone who has an influence on this process, like, why on earth, guys, are you not changing these regulations? I mean, I, I really do believe in this kind of, I wouldn't call it blaming and shaming, but like warning about the problems. Uh, I, I, I would really encourage everyone who, who gets the chance to do that, ask it. Okay, so I, I, yeah, I've heard this is happening in Hungary. I know that you know the Venice Commission said this, the Greco said that. So why don't you want judicial independence in Hungary? So I think it's important to 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 expose the problems. Obviously, ENCJ will not be able to strong arm the Hungarian legislature into into amending the laws, but I think raising them and also pro, uh, you know showing support whenever they meet someone. Or I mean, another idea. It, it could be possible to make it a requirement that judges should not be appointed, but judges should actually apply individually for this tra training program, saying that, okay, we want individual applications. 
and then making that kind of segue into into the training programs on an international level. So there are a couple of things I think that can be done, and I do believe in in small steps. I mean, if I wasn't an optimist, I wouldn't be doing the job that I'm doing today. So I, I, I think it's possible. Thank you. And um, Agnes, I'll give you the last word to you, please, if if, um, if you'd like to add anything to that. What can, you know, what can those outside of Hungary do to support the judiciary? Are there any suggestions that might come to mind? I would have a question to Victor. And what is the ENCG waiting for? So why is it hesitating to expel the, the, the Polish Judicial Council? And I think this is the this is the problem that at the international level, I mean, most of the important actors are hesitating to interfere. I, what, what I know that the uh, I was in the executive board. It ended just now at the, this general assembly in June. Uh, that uh, the executive board was very clear that we are we made our proposal for the expulsion, uh, but uh, we also realized that uh, according to our statute and regulation, we need to give the floor. To the to the involved party, to the Polish KRS, to if they want to defend something, they can want to speak up, just like in a uh, in a trial, that they are able to defend themselves and speak up uh, to provide a kind of fair trial for them. Uh, but uh, due to the COVID, uh, the ENCJ was not able to to meet. The General Assembly was not able to to meet. Uh, on the other hand, of course, also in the statute and regulations that. All the members, all the, uh, uh, not all the members, but everyone who is participating in the General Assembly and participating in this uh, in this ballot, we need three, three quarter majority for the decision of uh, exposure. Which means if someone would abstain for the reason that they, uh, they wanted to hear the Polish KRS personally before that and they wanted to then decide on this, then it would make this proposal uh, not maybe not strong enough. This is these are the reasons. Uh, so so the the, uh, the ENCG is waiting for the next general assembly. It will be in October, uh, and I think in October there will be a decision whether the uh, network will expose from the members the KRS or not. I don't think that there will be any changes in Poland, unfortunately, before that. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I'm looking at the clock and I'm afraid that's um, our time is out. But um, I found that hugely informative and I want to give sincere thanks to our panelists, to Judge Vadash, to Agnes and to Andras. Thank you so much for all the time you put into preparing and for being here, for giving up your afternoon. We really appreciate it. I want to thank uh, all of our participants as well. And uh, we look forward, as uh, Chris said, we look forward to uh, to welcoming members of uh, the Hungarian judiciary to our trainings at some stage in the future. So have a lovely evening, everybody. And hopefully we all meet each other again someplace soon. Take care and good night. Thank you.